All right, welcome. I'm Jake Fisher. I'm the director of Auto Test at Consumer Reports, and we are here to answer your questions. So we're going to be taking calls from real people and giving real answers. Um, normally, I'm up at the track in, in Connecticut, where we have 327 acres, where we test the cars. Um, not there today, actually. We're down in Yonkers, which is the head office of Consumer Reports, here with my colleagues Gabe and Tom. I'm Gabe Shenhar, Program Manager and Senior Auto Test Engineer. I'm Tom Mutchler, and I'm some of those words, too. <laughs> and we came down through a snowstorm today. Um, we're actually one of the few people here early in the morning. Um, it was kind of a mess. Um, yeah. what, what I drove the Lincoln MKZ, the brand new car we just got. Mm -hmm. Front-wheel drive, not all-wheel drive, because, of course, all the all-wheel drive cars disappear from the board as soon as there is one flake of snow in the forecast. You know, the thing is we're coming down here, me and Tom came down together, and it's like all the four-wheel drive cars, they're the ones in the woods. It seems like everyone's like, hey, this is great, I could get going, but they can't really stop or turn or any of those things to avoid accidents. But you're making me feel bad because, you know, I, I brought down a Mercedes GL. You know, it's a $73,000, 20,000-pound giant Teutonic <laughs> hunk of leather-lined <laughs> diesel-powered steel. I mean. What else am I going to drive in the winter? Although it's funny, I was talking to Jake on the drive down, and I said, you know, if I wasn't so cheap, I should have just brought my wife's Durango, which actually has snow tires, which would have been a better idea than some SUV, four-wheel drive or not, without them. Well, the but you'd be paying for the gas yourself. Well, no, no, in the Mercedes, you know, I mean, that thing will go like a million miles on a diesel <laughs> tank. Diesel, know, so we got that going for My Hemi Durango, I mean, I basically have to tow a tanker truck behind me. <laughs> Or a couple of gas stations. Yeah, you know, whatever. Yeah. Well, the Mercedes had like all these like, I mean, I was I was driving on the Mercedes and, and it's like we had all these like safety things popping up. And I guess most of the safety things don't happen to work when it was snowing or something. I, we were looking at it afterwards and it, it looked like the entire front of it was just like sandblasted with all the salt and Did the you snow. get the espresso cup? We, the espresso cup was there. There was like a breakfast cereal there. There was a bunch of icons. There was an icon that tells you the rear wipers on because you can't quite figure it out if you look back behind you and see the rear wiper on. But the thing that was killing me was this, and, and I was I was talking to Tom as we were coming down here. I'm driving down. It's like dark. It's snowing. It's a mess out there. Stability control is coming over on like you know every 20 right seconds. Yeah. I realized about a half an hour into it after I saw some Civic with the lights off. I'm like that guy's crazy. The lights weren't on in the car because it was on automatic. And when it's on automatic, it couldn't quite figure out from all these safety things to turn the lights on. So anyway, that was. See, the thing is, the Mercedes knew full damn well it was snowing because it told you all these expensive safety options that you paid for. They're not working, but it won't turn the lights on. But you had daytime running lights, right? I Did had you check if it was set for daytime I was running? thinking about getting out of the car <laughs> on the Merritt Highway, walking around and seeing if the lights were on. But um, it was all pretty much sandblasted. So, um, anyway, we're not here to whine about Mercedes-Benz or, uh, or snow. We're here to take some calls. Are you on the yeah, line? I, I, I can hear you, Jake. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you doing? And you're Sean? Yes. And where are you from? Uh, I'm uh, on the uh, outskirts of Philadelphia, the suburbs of Philly. All right, and what are you, what are you looking for? Well, how can we help you? Yeah, I'm currently in the market for a, um, I guess, a fun car, but you know, I have uh, you know, two car seats and a couple of strollers. Uh, primarily, it's going to be my commuter car, but uh, I'm looking at you know just driving the family around the weekends, you know, going to Costco and, and whatnot. That's hey, a very exciting dilemma. I wish I was in that uh, phase of life, <laughs> uh, having to choose uh, one of those fun cars. Well, uh, I've been looking at uh, the GLI. Uh, I saw your review online, and, and that looked like it was spacious. Uh, and also, it's kind of a stretch in terms of well, finances, but looking at the 3 Series, the BMW, mm -hmm. uh, as well as the uh, BMW X1, and just want to get your take on that. Hey, Sean, can I ask you, this is Tom, can I ask you, what, what does your budget top out at? Or uh, wh where would you like the price to be? Uh, somewhere in the mid-30s, well, that would be nice, but you know, I can push it up to closer to 40. Sean, let me ask you this. What do you have before? Oh, boy. Uh, you know, I bought my Honda in 1999, so I'm still driving it, my Honda Accord. And what do you like about it? What don't you like about it? Uh, I guess just the reliability, um, but it's, it's a coupe. It's a two-door coupe, so it's just <clears> not <throat> working for me now. Gotcha. What I don't like about the Honda is a, it's a very loud yeah. highway yep. noise. 
Yep. yep. Okay. Oh yeah. Good. Now we're we're going somewhere here. <laughs> uh, the GLI, uh, it's it's a great car. It's a lot of fun. Uh, everybody, when we tested it, everybody loved that car, and um, the the people we sold it to also love this car. I, I hear from them every now and then. So uh, that's uh, wow. that's about twenty eight thousand uh, dollars. Then to the X one, that's another ten thousand dollar jump. Uh, the only thing about the uh, GLI, it's a little bit of a low car, so uh, getting in and out with car seats might be a little challenging, so you want to try that out for yourself. You know, the thing that comes to mind is as much as we liked the GLI, we liked the Volkswagen GTI even more. You know, if, if you're willing to have the hatchback, if there's enough room in the back seat for you, that car has an even nicer interior, even better steering. Uh, you can get a really nice one for, for under $30,000. It's a very practical, very well-rounded car. The road noise is a lot lower than it's going to be in any sort of Accord. The other thing I was thinking of is, if you're around 30000 bucks, that buys you about a used 2011 3 Series wagon. Uh, and that's a lot of car for the money. One car to consider is a, is a G37. Because that car is getting redesigned, and they're coming out with the what is it, the, the Q50, Q50, whatever. Yeah. Um, this this is a phenomenal car, and what you could find is if, you know, the dealers know the new ones are coming online. They're going to so deal. They're going to give you a deal on that car, and that is a fast car that is sporty, that's going to be quiet, um, reliable too, and reliable too. Probably a lot more reliable than the German cars that we're talking about. Okay, thank you. All right, you're welcome. Why would Infinity drop a perfectly good name like G and oh, call everything Q? I'll tell you why. Because they have a marketing uh, head from Audi. And with Audi, everything is, starts with an A. So now everything starts with a Q for Infinity. I think it's because they're on crack and they screwed up. You know, it's like, it's like Acura. I mean, Acura did this. They had like Legend and Integra and all mm -hmm. these good things. And they're like, we're going to call it the RLTLLMNLQ. It was just. And so now they all have X's at the end. Yep. On the line, we have Stephanie. Stephanie, can you hear me? I can sure hear you. All right. How can we help you? Okay. Um, I lost the car to Hurricane Sandy. I'm sorry. And we need to replace it. Uh, we have other vehicles, but we had a reliable one in our garage at the Jersey Shore, which, of course, turned into an aquarium. Oh, jeez. And it's not funny, but it's the truth. Um, it was not new. It was a reliable vehicle we could keep there in case of emergency. But since the car I'm in now is an eight-year-old car, mm -hmm. we're considering buying a new car. And I've narrowed it down to the new Toyota Avalon Hybrid mm -hmm. uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, basically, we do a lot of research in Consumer Reports. There wasn't a lot on it because I understand it's a new model. But we're ho I'm hoping you can give me a little bit of information that was not in the magazine. Absolutely. Uh, one of the big things Consumer Reports does not advocate is taking an extended warranty. Is that still true? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, um, w with a car like that, I mean, you're looking at, obviously looking at reliable cars, you're reading Consumer Reports, which I highly advocate, uh, well done. Um, but. Uh, you're looking at a very reliable car to begin with. So the extended warranties, I mean, they're generally going to be taking in more money than they're putting out. So the cars are going to be I reliable. The issue is the battery on the hybrid. Its warranty is for eight years or 100,000 <clears> miles. <throat> right. After that, I'm not sure how much it costs to replace. So I was wondering if you had any idea what the replacement cost on one of those batteries is. Well, we have a lot of information from the older uh, Toyota hybrids, and there have not been a lot of problems with the Toyota hybrids. There hasn't been problems with the, uh, the uh, Priuses. There hasn't been problems with the other ones. So um, I think we're going to be in pretty good shape with those. W down the road, I mean, of, of the hybrids that have been, uh, had problems, there's been enough. I mean, you could... You're not going to wind up going to the dealership and buying a brand new battery, is, is the truth of it. Um, the people who have uh, older hybrids, older Priuses, they're going to get one out of a salvage yard that, you know, and they're paying three, four, five hundred dollars on it. So it, it's not a big concern. Excuse us? I was not even aware that was a possibility. Yeah, well, it's just like, you know, if you, if you, you know, here's the funny thing. I mean, if you have a car 
Say you have a car with 170,000 miles on it, right? And your transmission right. fails. A lot of people are like, well, what's a brand new transmission going to cost for that? Well, that's not what it goes on. You actually wind up getting a transmission out of a car of a salvage yard. Right, right. One other thing, the trunk space. Um, is it, do I really lose that much trunk space with this battery? A little bit. It? Yeah, but the thing is, you started with, you started with a trunk that was basically the size of an apartment building. I mean, the, the, the Avalon is a, a very big sedan with plenty of room. You might lose the, I think you lose the folding rear seat function. So if, you know, you're used to hauling <laughs> skis or right. two by fours inside, you won't get that. But there's still, there's still a lot of room in there. Well, thank you guys so much. You're welcome. Calls, and I appreciate all your input. All right. Thanks. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thanks for calling. Bye-bye. No, that Avalon Hybrid is a nice car. It's a nice car, yeah. All right. right we're going to take our next Nick. caller, um, Ken Smith from Maryland. Um, Ken, do you hear me? Yes, I do. All right. All right. Welcome, Welcome to our program. program. Thank you. Um, uh, well, I, I want to preface this by telling you I'm a Consumer Reports reader from way back. In fact, I can remember my father buying a 1967 International Harvester Travel All. <laughs> wow. <laughs> based on a report that uh, CR did back in 1962. Wow. <laughs> so this goes back a while. Uh, and I want you to take my question in, in this context. I have a couple of questions. My first relates to your numerical rating system. Uh, when I get the uh, auto issue, I'm like a young child getting uh, Life magazine or <laughs> or Discover or something like that. <laughs> so I've torn through it. Uh, and uh, I'm just, I just have a question about the numerical rating system. And the question is, are you evaluating all the vehicles using the same metrics, hmm. or are they separated by class? And does cost enter into the ratings factor? Um, and I guess the reason I ask this question is when I look on page five of the uh, April 2013 auto issue, there, there's a statement that says it's notable that two mid-sized sedans earn the highest tallies, outpacing several luxury cars, end quote. <laughs> and so that led me to believe it might be a uniform rating mm. scale across the board However, of course, as you proceed through the magazine, there, uh, there are various categories of vehicles. Sure, so, sure. So like on sedans, actually, they are in the same category. So if you look at sedans, like the Accord scored a 90, which we tested this year, and that outpaces some luxury sedans. Those actually are in the same category. Where it doesn't follow through with, say, sports cars. Um, we're not going to say the best sports car is the one that has the best rear seat and the best ride. So sports cars, we're obviously rating how sporty it is and, and the driving dynamics and this, how fast it is and how it handles. But you can't bring it across for a vehicle class like sedans, um, SUVs. We don't really care if it's a luxury SUV or non-luxury SUV. Um, there are some SUVs out there market. A Highlander is probably more luxurious than a bunch of luxury SUVs, probably an X90 or SE90 or something like that. Right. I mean, yeah. there's, also, there's also categories like pickup truck where you have to you have to take into account towing. You have to take into account the bed dimensions. You know, we realize that people buy these different vehicles for different uses, so the the scoring schemes change to to, to fit those those user needs. But one thing I'll add that uh, with through the testing process, all the judgments and all the measurements are the same. They're not adjusted to. Uh, to be on a different scale because of a category. It's just a weighting scheme that uh, vary between categories. Okay, so, I mean, would I be uh, reasonable in my interpretation that, for example, the 2000, 2013 Honda Accord scored a 90 versus a Mercedes-Benz Z350 scoring an 86, though they're close in the numbers, that in essence, on the same absolute scale, the Accord is a little higher rated vehicle. Would that be an accurate interpretation of the results? Well, that's, that would be accurate, but there are some, uh, I mean, the number is just a number, and it's really hard to uh, compress a complex reality into just numbers. So you have to read the words. So uh, between those two that you mentioned, for instance, uh, the Mercedes probably rides better and is quieter, but its controls are more complicated than the controls in the Honda Accord. They're really simple and easy. So and the sure. fuel economy. And the fuel economy good. of the Accord is better. Reliability of the Accord. So, I mean, you know, it depends on what, what's important to you, really what it comes down to. And, no, if a car has three points higher, that's not necessarily the best car for you. 
but overall, it is a better car. Thank you very much. All right, bye Take now. Take care. Bye. There is a nice. lot of scrutiny to the stuff that oh, we do. Yeah. What was that? The numbers? They're just numbers. It doesn't really matter. Right? Yeah, um, <laughs> that's the thing. I mean, uh, and sometimes also it's how we show uh, the cars in the magazine. I mean, if this car is three pages behind this car, it must be three pages worse. You know, <laughs> you know likewise, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to tell somebody who has their heart set on a Mercedes-Benz E-Class, ah, get the Accord, it scores four points more. Right, you right. know, there's, there's different needs and different wants that people have. Yeah, well, and that's exactly yeah. it. So, I mean, we do have the numbers, the comparative, but that's not the end all for this stuff. Right. You know, you got to figure out what's important to you. And, um, you know, if you're buying one car because it's one point higher than the other car and it's a different animal, that's not the way to... It's not the way to do it. That's right. I mean, a number a number's got two digits. We, we write hundreds or thousands of words for each car. You know, the words matter, too. All right. So everyone's asking about what they should buy. Here's the question. What what have we bought? Um, what, what cars have you actually purchased? I mean, we drive the test cars every day, and we don't need to have our own car. Um, didn't you have, like, a... Buick Electra or something like that. Hey, 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 <laughs> hey, 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 That was that was handed down to me from my grandfather. You know, it actually used to be a former funeral home car. You know, they, oh, they would sounds good. Oh, you, know, you know, the, the inside was blue a, velour, just a like coffin? a coffin. <laughs> well, no, the, 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 the blue velour inside was real similar to I think what you could get. Tales I mean, of the crypt. I wasn't expecting that. My next question is, what was the coffin full? I hope not. Oh. Although you know, the trunk in that car was so big, you could easily uh, transport uh, bodies without any problem. No, um, I, my wife and I own a 2011 Dodge Durango with a Hemi. And I remember, you know, we tested a Durango like around 08, and I could have never imagined owning a Durango. The thing was like a wee boy. It would just wobble down the road and bounce around. But boy, oh, you know, nice. Chrysler went and they, they really did a good job with that redesign. We loved the truck it tows our trailer real well it sucks the gas real well but it's got a hemi and it does have a hemi and thank you mercedes-benz for leaving that uh, with chrysler after the divorce yeah that was quite a parting yeah. gift wasn't yeah, it that was <laughs> wonderful yeah, yeah both the, the grand cherokee and the good durango took basically yeah. a lot of the chassis from that vehicle yeah. is, is, but is you recently that. gave up <clears> a car you had a long time oh yeah i just broke a tradition of 14 years of owning uh, two volkswagen passats and uh i mean they were Terrific, uh, but uh, you know, you need to move on sometimes in life. So uh, now we have a BMW X3 2011, which is wonderful because it already carried uh, my son's drums to various places and the phone integration. I mean, she'll figure it out, uh, that whole thing. So she loves that. So, so always buying the German cars because Consumer Reports always says German cars are very reliable, right? Or, or we don't. Yeah, Maybe yeah. we don't. Well, you know, I think yeah, I think I I had uh, a Corolla and an Infiniti G20 in my past, and <coughs> uh, I have to say, I don't know, it just, uh, I mean, they were so trouble-free, that it was almost boring. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what we always say, you know, the excitement. We actually give extra points for cars that surprise you. That's why, like yeah. the Fisker, we gave her like a lot of high points to that because you never knew how the car was gonna. Fail. Oh no! Today. Wait, wait, we did it. <laughs> no, we did it. Oh, that's right, we did it at all. But you know, I remember Gabe once. Gabe gave me advice to buy a Passat. I, I bought a Passat two oh, back in right, two thousand, yeah. a wagon, and uh, you know, I mean, it was the total car geek enthusiast wagon, no sunroof, steel wheels, cloth interior. <laughs> you know, and and on was the G twenty or a copy? Uh, that's right. Too. I bought an Infiniti yeah. G twenty too, uh, but. Yeah, you know, I think you did well to let the Passat go before the bad before, time comes. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, after 10 years, 60-something well, thousand But, but you've got a car that's, like, reliable as the sunrise. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I have never bought a Passat, although I agree it's really nice to drive. But, um, yeah, my wife, not me, my wife's got a Prius, and that car's got 80,000 miles on it, and it just works every day nothing goes wrong with this car ever i don't think i would buy that myself because it's kind of boring as dirt but it goes I, it's totally efficient totally. it's perfect for her i keep telling everybody that i mean there's so many people who just need a car but don't care about the car actually i mean it's just a necessity prius, prius is, is the car. definition of 
as a perfect transportation and economical solution. Yeah, I totally if agree. If you want a car just for transportation, point A to point B, and you want to spend the least am amount of money, have the least amount of headache, this is You're the car. You're not going to have those excitement of the car Nothing. breaking down. I don't no, care it's, about it's it. Pour, it's pouring a sin. <laughs> yes, I mean, but, but, but the steering care. feel isn't yeah. there. There's no, There's not so much. No luxury so much. I mean, does your wife want something nicer, plush? She is happy with it. She is totally, it's totally function. I mean, this car does, fuel I mean, function. it's got great fuel economy. It's worth now probably more than what you bought it. <laughs> I mean, with fuel prices as they are. Um, my cars, I mean, I've never actually bought a new car. I think the most expensive car I've ever bought was my, uh, the last car I had before I started working here was my MR2. So I plunked down four grand for my 1987 Toyota MR2. Mm -hmm. And that also a very reliable vehicle, um, fuel efficient, and really, really fun. Mm -hmm. I still have it, and it's in my garage all done up in race car trim. I think I paid four grand in total in repairs to one of my old Volvo 2 <laughs> <laughs> I think my MR2 is actually worth more than four grand. At this I think point. just the modifications you put on the MR2 are uh, probably yes. more than what you spend buying it. <laughs> yeah, I th maybe. I don't know. <laughs> it's a lot of work, work myself on it, but yeah, probably. Probably more go fast parts on it. But yeah. two Toyota household and, you know, very consistent Prius, MR2 race car. They're the Fair. same thing, really. Very similar. Yeah. Very similar. Both big back seats. Exactly. <laughs> Excellent auto Fuel crosses. efficient, <laughs> yeah. reliable. Yes. Exactly. So we, this is not a caller, but we have a question somebody submitted on the blog. So just in the interest of answering people's questions, someone had asked us on the blog, why don't we test front wheel drive SUVs? And as we know, a lot of people buy front wheel drive SUVs because SUVs these days are not trucks anymore. Mm -hmm. They're station wagons. And why have a four-wheel drive station wagon if you live in Southern California or Florida? And actually, it's a really, really good question. It is. And, and uh, you know, as SUVs become not just snow cars, and they become, you know, they come in all sizes, all prices, and what we're seeing now are those SUVs that are based on subcompacts, like the Nissan Juke and the Buick uh, Encore. And, uh, I mean, is there any reason for these to have all-wheel drive? Uh, so it's it's really a good question. I mean, the the way we do it now with the all-wheel drive is that it allows comparing apples to apples in terms of acceleration, fuel economy, which may all change uh, with just front-wheel drive. So well, that's exactly right. So I mean, that's what we do, and that's and that's the answer. Right. If we would test some of them in front-wheel drive and some of them four-wheel drive. You can't compare them. What we have found in our testing, and we've done some of this, we've done front wheel drive versus all wheel drive. Generally, what we find, it's about one mile one per MPG. gallon. And, yeah, and usually about a second zero to 60. I mean, you know, you can almost, you can almost predict the, the drop in performance and the drop in fuel economy. And that, that goes find, pretty much across the board. Find your heaviest friend, have him get in the back seat. I mean, what's the difference? We're That's right, take your stop watch. About, about 250, 250, 250 200 pounds. 200 pounds. Yeah. Get them in the back, drive around the vehicle. That's about it, the difference you're going to see in acceleration. And there's no uh, difference uh, in the driving behavior of the, the two. The only thing we have seen is that sometimes those front wheel drive SUVs, it's a lot of peeling out. Yes. <laughs> you know, you could put a v V6 front wheel drive, right. and you hit the gas, and it's, well, although that could be a plus. Maybe you want to, you know, do some burnouts with your. Kia Sorento or something. I don't know. Yeah. You never know. So, I mean, you know, yeah. dealing with the realities of, of living in Connecticut, you know, living in the Northeast, most SUVs sold around here are all-wheel drive. Um, you know, we've done some crazy road trips to buy cars that are rear, you know, especially Mercedes or Infinities or luxury sedans like that. We've done crazy road trips to try to get those cars in rear drive instead of all-wheel drive. Uh, it, you know, it, it's better for us testing wise to to test more different products than just two versions of the same product front wheel drive versus all wheel drive so that's why we, we try to spread out the testing resources rather than doing two of the same car hello peter yeah well, how are you us? the dream that i was trying to save up for was uh was the tesla it sounds like that one is a little too new to rate at least looking at <clears> the <throat> magazine but do you have any thoughts on where that's going and uh, at least their early impressions of the car is it looking like it's going to be a, a leader in its um, sort of alternate energy space. Yeah, we have a Tesla that we bought, uh, you know, about a month and a half ago and uh, it's uh, just, uh, it's in the pipeline where we just, we're just starting to test it uh, 
but uh, we've uh, we have a few updates on our blog if you uh, go online and I think you'll get a pretty good uh, taste of what what's to come I mean the car is really really impressive and uh, it's something so eerie about being so quiet and so fast it drives really well yeah the car is pretty amazing I mean it could be totally a game changer for electric vehicles I mean it's you know, I mean, Gabe's right. I mean, it's 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 so fast, it's it's disorienting, because you don't hear anything. You don't hear the engine rev up, and the thing just catapults you forward into space. I mean, it's like, you know, hitting light speed or whatever. But um, you know, it's it's luxurious, it's roomy, it's sporty. Um, I'm not going to make any guesses about reliability. I mean, we're talking about a, a new company here. Um, right. But technology-wise. Holy crap. I mean, it is just completely up to the gills in the technology. I mean, big battery, long range. Um, fast charging. Fast charging. The technology and just the controls and everything. I mean, the thing's got, it's got a giant iPad that runs the thing. And, I mean, you could surf the internet while you cruise around. I mean. Not that we. No, uh, not that we're no, 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 don't, don't do that. <laughs> don't, don't do that. But you could if you wanted to, but you don't want to. But it's it's. No, I have a colleague who got one, and it, oh, yeah? it was just so mind blowing. Just getting <laughs> in it, I thought, well, this is what I want to do. And I thought I'd have more time to sort of you know, prepare to do it. I just knew, but it it is just the reaction. I think everybody just says, "Oh my gosh!" When you when you yeah, you it really it is. In it. You know, I'm actually somewhat more interested in the third car from Tesla down the road because I mean, they're talking about you know, there's an SUV that's coming out, which model I guess X. you have to do an SUV because everyone likes SUVs. Right. But the third model they keep on talking about, which is going to be a less expensive a model. $40,000 car, BMW 3 Series competitor. Yeah, and, and, and like we tell, I mean, regardless of what kind of car you're looking for, we always say that you don't want to be the first one. You don't want to buy the, you don't even want to have the first year of a uh, new Camry. You know, I mean, you want to wait until the bugs are worked out and maybe down the road, all this stuff is going to be working great. All right. Well, thanks for calling in. Well, thank you guys for the information. All right. All right good good luck. luck. Good luck. Thanks. Bye-bye. All right. Bye now. Yeah, we could do a whole show talking about that Tesla. <laughs> well, we haven't even tested it yet. It doesn't matter. segment, yeah. We'll, we'll, like... we'll do our next show just about the Tesla, and then we'll, yeah. when we test it, we'll do a couple more shows about that. Well, maybe we should talk a little bit about what is new at the track. We've um, been on a buying spree recently. We have a lot of new stuff. Yeah, um, and we just uh, bought ourselves two uh, Lincoln MKZs, uh, one uh, Buick Encore, and there are a lot of cars that are just uh, coming out instead of a traditional fall introduction uh, in February and March, and most of them are 2014s, like the Mazda 6. Uh, there is a refreshing Kia Sorento we just got. Uh, so uh, anything else? Uh, well, we also have a new Jeep Grand Cherokee. You know, I'm, I'm fond of my Durango, and the Grand Cherokee is a, another platform made of that. Got a new uh, eight-speed automatic, uh, mm -hmm. upgraded some of the interior electronics. I just drove that Grand Cherokee the other day, and that is a lovely vehicle. Uh, I mean, it was quiet, comfortable, agile, uh, nice seat. Uh, that Uconnect, that Chrysler Uconnect, that's the best interface for a touchscreen anywhere. That's simple. Yeah. But you know what surprised me was the MKZ. I mean, you know, I'm not quite in the Lincoln demographic. And I mean, the last Lincoln that was fun to drive was the LS, yeah, was. which no one remembers. And, you know, it was kind of a flop. But that, that, that MKZ, what a nice driving car. Sure. Yeah, it is. And, uh, just like uh, a Fusion. It's, it's nice and sophisticated. And I think it's probably the best car, I mean, bar that LS, which is a commercial flop, but actually it was a, a very well sorted out car. That MKZ is, is a really very appealing kind of car. Yeah, well, I mean, you look at what they did before with the MKZ and the Fusion, it was like the, the Fusion's always kind of had pretty decent driving dynamics, you know, decent steering feel. And then they go to the, you know, the Zephyr and the MKZ and they're like, oh, we need to make it luxury. So we need to disconnect the steering from the, the wheels. And they didn't do this at all. I mean, they got it right. Yeah. It's it's sporty, it's nice to drive, yeah. yeah. But I just, uh, th there's one pet peeve with the MKZ. I think they were so overzealous attracting younger demographics that they made all the fonts in the instrument panel 
So they're so small, they're impossible to read without your reading your, glasses. Your one pet peeve is the fonts. That, uh, yeah. The whole so my link if you're, touch with if, the thing. If you're older, than, <laughs> if you're older than 47, don't even. Woo, know. I'm good then. <laughs> <laughs> Buy the they weren't good for me. <laughs> but, but you know, you talk about appealing luxury, and then there's the Buick Encore. I mean, it's kind of a weird product. You know, That's it's, a fake luxury. <laughs> it's, it's really small. I mean, you know, it, I looked up the numbers. It's about the same length as a Volkswagen Beetle. I mean, you know, it's, you know, Buick needs, they, they need a small SUV. Mm -hmm. All luxury brands need an SUV. I mean, yeah. it, it's, yeah, it's right. free money. You know? Oh, yeah, yeah. But, but what they need is they need a luxury version of an Equinox. Or, or the maybe. Chevy Captiva. How's that? Oh, the old view. Yeah, well, I mean, really? well, while you're digging up stuff, you could dig up, you know, the 94X. You know, I don't think Saab's doing much with that design right now. <laughs> but, but you know, Buick, Buick stuck because their 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 three-row Enclave is a forty-one thousand dollar SUV. So there's no room in the lineup. So they had to go with this little tiny thing. Okay, we have another call on the line. This is Mike from East Lyme, Connecticut. Mike, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Welcome. Oh, thanks for having me on. You're very welcome. A neighbor. Yeah, you're nearby. Yeah. yeah, not too far. You guys, uh, guys, the snow's slowing you down at all today? We had a good time this morning driving, driving through the snow. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, not too bad. <laughs> um, well, I uh, was kind of wondering on the uh, uh, car purchasing uh, uh, arrangements. Um, I was looking at uh, one of your articles from not too long ago about the uh, Tesla Model S and how you guys seem to enjoy the, uh, the purchasing experience you had. Mm -hmm. And was curious if you guys ever expected anything to change with the uh, car buying climate with anybody else other than high-end cars that people are willing to pay a lot for or excited for or willing to wait. We, t we talked about the Tesla Model S at nauseum. But, you know, there's so much going on with that car, but it seems like they change a lot of things. And It's yeah, a game changer in every way. And, uh, and as to the buying process, I mean, it was terrific. You didn't have to go to a dealer, you did everything on your laptop, and they have a nice, <coughs> easy, uh, user-friendly interface. Everything is, uh, they use DocuSign, everything is electronic, it's, it's beautiful, everything is clear. And you just uh, sit it out and wait. So and, they, 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 and then you choose uh, personal delivery, so uh, what's not to like here? You know, in the future, I mean, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, I don't see why this just has to be a luxury type of thing, because if you don't have a dealership you have to deal with, with all that inventory, it actually makes sense from a dollar a cent uh, standpoint. So, I mean, there's been rumbling some, some Chinese automakers that have wanted to get in the market. They were thinking about doing something like that. Um, but, yeah, wouldn't it be nice? You could just kind of order your car from Amazon, you know, and you could get your new... Uh, you know, smart car or whatever it is, and they deliver it. Yeah, I would, I would love that myself. That's how, how I prefer to order everything else. And <laughs> you're, you're not alone. alone. But I mean, what's also something. nice is service. I mean, um, Hyundai was bragging that with the Equus, they they have a deal. You know, they're 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 sixty thousand dollar big sedan. Um, they basically, you don't have to go to the dealer. Someone will come pick up the car. They'll give you a loaner. You know, you never have to go there once you buy it. And supposedly, a good number of people were taking advantage of that. So, I think. I think there's a demand out there. I think it's going to be slow to grow, you know, especially when people are so stuck on the idea of getting a car for the absolute best, lowest price. You know, this, this, this might not let you do that, you know, if you have that sort of uh, customer service. But I think, I think there's a demand out there. Yeah, to me, it's, uh, it's something that's such an expensive item that I don't buy nearly as often. It seems to me like there's a lot to be had. You know, I'm not fixated on the price, but making sure that I get what I want and not buying things I, I don't want. Um, so I'm just cur curious why, you know, why the majority of people are content to go to a lot and pick something that's available and end up with features they may not particularly have cared, cared to, to pay for. Yeah, you're totally right. I mean, it's not optimal at all. Um, you know, the, they're... I don't know if they're content or just they have no other choice. I mean, I, I know... I mean, we, we buy cars all the time because we buy the cars that we test. Right. And... Um, you know, I mean, there's there's three Honda dealerships within like 20 minutes from me. I don't really need that. You know, I think about all the inventory that's sitting there, um, and I can only choose from there. Um, I know when I order a lot of things, I usually order online, and I get exactly what I want. Um, that seems to be more efficient. <laughs> it certainly works better. I mean, it's frustrating, too, because, you know, dealers now, you can look at the online inventories. You can find out where things are. And, you know, say a dealer has a car equipped the way you want in New York. Well, 
That dealer in Connecticut, it depends if he's really willing to put the effort into it to make the phone call to go get the car that's in New York. When, when I can buy, again, I can buy something on Amazon Prime, I can have everything within two days. You know, a, a car, it should be easier. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of legal reasons why it is the way it is. I mean, there's certain laws about the way the dealers operate, and it seems like Tesla operates outside the realm of... They break all the rules. Yeah, whether it's, you know, whether it's <laughs> physics or if it's <laughs> electric charge capacity or legal reasons, because... I mean, uh, like we were just talking about before, it's like you can go surf the internet while you drive the car, whereas every other car that we drive around, you have to sign a release whether or not to you know, set the nav system, and then you can't do that until you pull over. So they're doing things differently. So, so maybe one of the offshoots of Tesla is they're gonna kind of break through some of these things and other automakers can follow. All right, hey, hey I'm glad we got a chance to talk. Um, thanks for calling in. Well, thanks for having me, I appreciate it. All right, cool. So, I mean, Thank our last caller and thank everyone who called in. Um, thanks for being patient with us. This is our first time doing this. Hopefully we'll do some more. Um, if you are reading this in the blog or downloading from the blog, please feel free and give us some feedback and let us know what the name of this is gonna be too. Um, we certainly could use some help and uh, see what you think. Um, thanks for me and the rest of us. Thanks a lot.